you better see me? Yes, we can. Great, OK. Can imagine, imagine ourselves being a bit cooler up there with you. I saw it yeah. last week you had some snow, so... We did, yeah, yeah. Well, welcome, everybody, um, to the Highlands of Scotland. Uh, so we're in the Cairngorms National Park. In fact, if I turn around, you might be able to see the, the main Cairngorm um, mountain range behind me. Uh, so our farm, or where I'm standing here at the minute, uh, is about 350 metres above sea level uh, and the croft goes down to about 320 metres and it goes up to about 450 metres. So what I wanted to do today uh, is to bring you on a very, very short tour. It's a little bit windy. Um, I've tried to muffle my microphone with a little bit, bit of sheep's wool, which I hope will keep the worst of the wind off. Uh, but whilst we're up here, I just wanted to uh, introduce you to these guys. So hopefully you saw in the information um, that I sent around is we run a very kind of diversified setup here. So we're, we're only small uh, Scottish wise. We're, we're 150 acres. Um, now I'm aware that that's kind of bigger than the average farm size in, in England. Uh, but of that 150 acres, about 10% of that uh, would be in by ground and pretty much the rest is either uh, woodland or hill ground. So we really need animals uh, that are going to work well for us up here. Um, and as I say, we've gone for a very kind of diversified setup. So uh, these guys, uh, so this is our uh, Highland Fold. Um, so we started off uh, in 2018 uh, with just three. Uh, we're now up to nine uh, and we just had a, our first little calf uh, who's just lying over there in the corner near mum. We have Highlanders uh, just purely because they are just absolutely perfect for our ground. Uh, they're hardy, they're hairy and they produce a fantastic beef, uh, all of which we retail locally. And just showing you a little bit of the kit that we have. Uh, so just like Andy, Andy you've got good taste, we use Kiwi Tech as well. Uh, we use a double strand and the reason being is because uh, our heifers have horns, uh, we find that uh, the double strand stops them from reaching under the fence. When we use a single strand, we find that they reach under the fence and then whip it up with their horns. So the double strand uh, helps to mitigate against that. And we also uh, use a Kiwi Tech uh, water trough, uh, which one of our steers is just standing uh, next to. Uh, because again, like Andy, uh, we, we very much follow um, a holistic planned grazing setup here, uh, which in the summertime uh, becomes into a mob. Um, and whilst these guys are outwintered all year round, uh, we only actually started grazing them on Saturday. So the, the grass uh, takes a long time to get going up here, uh, 57 degrees north, uh, everything kind of is working against us. Uh, so we need our team of cattle to be able to turn the roughest stuff uh, into, into beef. So as I walk down through the field, I just want to point you out uh, our uh, hens. Uh, so we have about 100 layers here uh, on the croft. Again, slowly building up. We started with three um, in 2016 uh, and we're now up to, to just in about 100. And about half of them we run in a mobile um, pasture based system. Uh, so we have designed our own egg mobile, uh, you know, kind of pinching ideas from everybody else. Uh, but ours is made of wood because we really need it to be solid up here. Uh, to give you an example, uh, in the winter time, uh, we park this next to a tree so it's protected. Um, but even uh, last week, uh, the ladies have been out in the field since April. And we had gusts on the top of Cairngorm at 120 miles per hour. And there's nothing between us and Cairngorm. So it's incredibly, incredibly windy up here. So we need something that's really solid and that's not going to blow away on us. Um, we just started with the Eggmobile in 2018 and we've noticed a phenomenal uh, impact that the hens have had uh, on the grass growth. So we have a lot of moss and a lot of thatch in the grass because the fields hadn't been grazed for many, many years before we took over Limbrek. And so what the hens do is just hens being hens, uh, they just scratch through the grass, scratch out a lot, a lot, a lot of the moss and a lot of the thatch. Um, so much so that last year this area recovered so well uh, we basically lost track of it. Uh, it completely went away with itself and we ended up having quite a lot of thatch build up over the winter, which was, which was great for the, for the Highlanders, they worked through it. Um, but we find that the scratching that the hens do, um, adding their own natural fertility, 
uh, is really, really beneficial. And our idealized, um, I, you know, I guess, plan whenever we got the hens was that we would run it like a Joel Salatin enterprise or a Richard Parkins enterprise. And we would, you know, follow the, the, the cows with the hens. But the vast majority of our, of our land is like that. Uh, so we only have a, a, a small flat area that we can work the hens. But we still find that they're really useful at uh, scratching through cow pats, spreading that uh, manure and helping them, helping them break, break the, the cow pats down. So as I sort of start to, to descend into one of the lower areas, um, I, I just want to tell you a little bit about our background. Uh, so we, we're completely new to farming, completely new uh, in 2016 when we bought Limbrek. Uh, our backgrounds were in, in sort of conservation and then we worked on a lot of woodland restoration projects in the borders. Um, so all we really knew was uh, nature, um, conservation and, and trying to I guess, work with natural processes in, in, in a kind of previous jobs that we had. So I guess that's what gave us our introduction into choosing the way to farm that we do. Um, we always believe that nature is our greatest asset, our land is our greatest asset, uh, our soil health, all our animals, all of those sorts of things. Um, and so therefore, if we look after them, they'll look after our business. Um, and one of the first projects that we took on uh, whenever we came uh, to Limbrek uh, was just in here. So this is uh, an area of hill ground. It's probably about, I don't know, I guess about 35 acres in total. Uh, it goes right down to the bottom where there's a, a gully and then right up to the top at about 450 meters above sea level. And, you know, whenever you look at that with a farming head on, um, there's not a huge amount of um, potential in there for uh, turning, uh, turning kind of animals into, into cash product. Um, but we looked at what was happening naturally and there was a lot of natural regeneration. This area hadn't had any grazing in it for about 30 or 40 years, just some, some deer. And so we basically took the guide of nature, uh, is the best way to put it, uh, and decided to plant. Um, so we have planted a broadleaf woodland of 17 and a half thousand trees. Um, and we did that in 2017. And it goes right from the bottom up to the very, very top. Uh, and it's a mixture of broadleaf species such as uh, birch, uh, willow, oak, uh, aspen, hazel, uh, hawthorn, a whole mix of things. And um, what we started to, to, I guess, kind of um, tap into was the fact that not only were we kind of working with a natural process trying to do this, um, we, we live in a really, really, really windy area. Uh, so today it's it's windy, but it's 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 not windy. It's very 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 mild, um, and normally um, you know it's it's really difficult to find areas where our animals can shelter. So we started to realise that by planting woodland, uh, that was actually going to probably in the future, in the long term actually increase the areas where we can have our animals. So at the minute they're excluded, but when that woodland gets up, uh, that will uh, become a really diverse uh, woodland where the animals will be able to browse on the tree leaves, uh, where they'll be able to get shelter in both the winter and the summertime. Um, and it's also taken all the boxes that we wanted to for nature as well. So that was our first big project. Um, and I guess the theme of trees is a very strong theme here. Uh, so with our 150 acres or which is roughly about 60 hectares, about 30 hectares of that has either gone into new woodland or is existing woodland on the croft. And again, that's because we were thinking about long-term planning. So we're thinking about nature, but we're thinking about shelter for the animals. And we're thinking about maximizing uh, the land that we have for the best use that we have. So of existing woodland, uh, it makes about three hectares. Uh, it's mostly birch. And um, we use that uh, for our pigs in the winter time. Um, we work our pigs through the woodland, and the goal there is to break up this sort of dense tussocky mat of fairly kind of monoculture, thick, coarse grasses, uh, to break that up, um, to add their own manure, and then to create uh, some little patches of bare soil. Uh, for tree seeds to set, uh, for things in the relic seed bank to have an opportunity to come up. Um, and that's all part of the story that we then tell to our customers. Um, so we sell all of our pork as we do our beef uh, to 100% local market. 
and we sell it in two ways. Uh, we sell it via uh, mixed meat boxes, seasonal meat boxes, whenever they're available. And we also sell it through a subscription-based club. So again, like Andy, um, I don't mean to be your twin here, Andy, but we also have a butchery on site. Uh, we do all of the butchery ourselves. Um, just like we weren't farmers, we're not butchers either, uh, but through a, a bit of training and just kind of getting stuck in and giving it a go uh, and working with our environmental health officer, we've now uh, learned how to, to do uh, the butchery of our pork and we do part of our, our, our cows as well. Um, and that's a really, really great asset for us because it's cost saving. Um, and also it, it means that we can do a lot of added value produce. So we do a lot of uh, artisan type um, burgers and sausages. Uh, we do smoked, uh, smoking and curing, uh, and we're hoping to move into air drying as well. So as I've just been chatting about that, uh, I've come to this area here. Um, so I'll just turn the, the camera around to you. So um, back to the theme of trees. Um, we don't cut our own hay here at Limbrek. We just, we just don't really have the, the land to spare because we utilize it all for our grazing. So we do, we do buy in hay. Um, and what we noticed here quite quickly uh, was that um, in this area, it's becoming harder and harder to find a, a hay window uh, for cutting. So either uh, one year we had a drought, believe it or not, we pretty much five months without any rain. Um, so the, the hay, uh, the hay was, 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 was very, very limited available. Uh, or it's wet, uh, or it just rains. We cannot get a hay window. Um, you know, you might get two dry days in a row, but other than that, it's really, really difficult. So we were again thinking about long-term resilience. And um, a few years ago, I used to be involved with an organisation when I lived down uh, just outside London called the Ancient Tree Forum. And there was a guy there who used to talk about something called tree hay. So that's just a, a curlew. You might see uh, just you get a lot of nesting and breeding curlews on the croft at the minute. Um, so anyway, yeah, so, so he used to talk about tree hay and he used to say that, you know, tree hay was something that was, you know, really widely practiced throughout Europe and throughout Britain um, until fairly recently, until I guess the mechanization and industrialization of agriculture. And he talked particularly about species like things like ash that were, were uh, coppiced regularly for, for tree hay. But, you know, really, you know, a lot of species could, could apply. So we started to, to read up on it um, and, um, and decided to, as a trial, uh, to plant our own tree hay crops. Um, we can't, as I say, we, we don't really have enough capacity to provide our own hay, but we thought, well, we have a lot of this sort of kind of semi-marginal land that it's not really doing much else. Um, we're certainly not losing any kind of high value grazing. Um, so we went to the approach the Woodland Trust and we said, well, we, we have this idea. We don't, we don't really know what we're doing and we don't really know if it's going to work. Um, but we'd like to, to plant these um, tree hay copses. So they agreed to fund it. Um, and what we did was we used um, basically uh, biomass um, measurements. Uh, so we've got about uh, half a meter between each tree. And we've planted, this is, this is a copse here of alder but the majority of our copses are of willow. So they're all species uh, that will grow here uh, quite well. Uh, so it's wet, generally, um, and we'll put up with a lot of wind. And so we've planted 10 of these. Uh, so the copses are 10 by 10 meters. We've got 10 in this lower field. And the idea is that whenever they grow up, uh, we'll coppice or pollard uh, two every year. So we'll have a five year rotation. And we'll take off the branches. Um, and what we're trialing at the minute is bundling and drying uh, tree, tree hay that we, we, we make on the croft uh, to see about, you know, how best to dry, how best to feed it to the animals. Uh, what kind of space does it take? What kind of infrastructure do you need for all of that? Because we don't know really is the honest answer. Uh, so we're trialing a lot of that at the minute. Um, and hopefully uh, by the time that stuff gets uh, ready to be harvested, uh, we'll have a, have a better idea of a system. And we'll also have a better idea of how other people can uh, implement this on their farm as well. It's adding into the fact that trees uh, are able to pull up um, a lot of minerals and nutrients that aren't always readily available in grasses. So there's a huge amount that our animals can get from browsing these. 
Um, and, and that's very much what we're wanting to, to look at a little bit more. So I'm just taking you on a little bit further. Uh, as I do, I just wanna point out this area here. So this is what an area, we call it the flats. Uh, it's basically a big bog. Uh, it's not a very boggy bog, um, but it has its moments. Uh, but there's quite a lot of forage out there for our Highland cattle. And that again is another reason why our Highland cattle are absolutely perfect um, for, for the land that we have. Because in the summertime, uh, we throw the cattle out there uh, they can survive out there for about a week uh, without much difficulty and it buys us a week to additional week to rest the paddocks in our field. Uh, so we use it maybe about three to four times a year and again it's, it's just a really uh, great space to have not just for nature but it is something that we can work into our, our farm business, which is, which is really important to try and maximize um, the amount of land that we have and what we, can, what we can produce on it. And the last uh, animals that I want to um, introduce you to are, are our pigs. So we buy in wieners here. Uh, we use uh, Oxford Sandy and Black pigs. And as I say, we run them in groups. So in the winter time, uh, we just run them in, in, in our woodlands. And in the summertime, um, we're trialing a lot of different things. So last year, uh, we had the pigs in the fields in fairly small paddocks. And we got them to really kind of target the area. And then we moved them weekly. And so this year, what we've decided to do is, is not put them in our fields, but to monitor the impact uh, that the pigs have had in there. This year, uh, we've got them in the area that we call our lower field, which is fairly marginal grazing. You can probably hear them. I'm gonna let you see them here. Hey boys. So this is the area that they have. So in total, uh, they have about an acre. You probably won't be able to hear a word I'm saying, so I'll move away from them. Uh, so they have about an acre. And um, we're really keen for them to, um, to really kind of get their snouts in, to start to turn it over a little bit, uh, to really work the ground. Because what we are seeing in areas where we have worked uh, the pigs is that the growth, uh, the grass growth is coming back really strong. Um, what we want to see within that is increasing diversity. Um, and we think that these guys are really, um, yeah, they're, they're really great at doing that. So I'm going to head back up to the croft. Um, the one, uh, I guess, team uh, that you've not met are our bees. Uh, so we have five hives of uh, bees here at Limbrek. Um, we got them as pollinators. Uh, so again, trying to think about improving diversity. Uh, that's a kind of key um, invertebrate that we need. Uh, so we started off with two hives, uh, we now have five, and um, we find that uh, honey is probably one of our most um, sought after products. Uh, everybody wants honey, um, and we're in an area where we can pretty much say that we're fairly sure that we're totally chemical free within the area that the, the bees are going to be flying in, um, and we produce uh, blossom, uh, wildflower and tree honey um, in sort of July time. And then about September time, uh, we're onto the heather honey. Uh, and again, that's a really useful, um, uh, yeah, another product for us to be able to sell. Um, and then the last thing that we do, uh, and then I'll stop talking and I'll pass back to Russ, is, uh, so here at Limbrek, um, I guess, yeah, I guess we're really, really passionate about what we do, uh, but we're really passionate about telling that story and trying to help people to reconnect um, with the food that they eat. That's such, such an important um, motivation for us. And so uh, a big thing that we do as part of our diversification is getting people here, getting people to come here. So we do tours, obviously not when it's a global pandemic, but when it's not a global pandemic, we do tours. So we do uh, public tours monthly, we do private tours, 
Uh, this year we were due to um, start our, our new course, um, which is basically um, sort of explaining to people how it is practically you can go about setting up your own small farm business. Um, and uh, we do uh, talks, uh, we do lots and lots of engagement. And we think it's, it's our role um, to do that because nobody can tell the story uh, or help to build those bridges as much as the people that actually are on the ground and, 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 and do it every day. So that's the other aspect of what we do. Uh, so you're lucky you've got a really great day. I mean, I'd love to say it's like this all the time.